Well, how many of you are excited to be in the house of God today? It's good. So, so kind of you're just like in the middle of the road. Well, we've been talking about, well, we started a new series last week on faith, uh, what faith will do. Because I, I want us to ask questions. I want us to, to corner God. I want us to believe that if the word says it, that it's true. That if God didn't mean it when he said it, he shouldn't have said it. But if he did say it, that it's going to come true. That it's going to come to pass. Amen? Amen? If not, we're just playing church. We all might as well just go to the movies and watch the latest dud remake of some horrible movie. You know? Because no one's got any more good ideas. Or new ideas, I should say. But I believe and we believe as a body of Christ that what God has given to us in his word is the absolute truth. It is factual. And so what I want us to do is I want us to take God at his word. Because before I became the lead pastor, my dad was pastor for 39 years of my life. He passed away. God put that calling on my heart, on my life. And I said, of course, Lord, I'll answer the call. Knowing the heavy responsibility, but also the privilege that comes with, with leading a church. Because I grew up in it my whole life. And one big thing that I, that I wanted, that I, just pressing God, pressing into him, God, if, if, if you call me to this, I want to see your word come to life. I want to see what we see in the Old Testament and what we see in the New Testament, when we, what we see in the early church. That's got to happen. And then God put it back on me. If God is faithful... And he never fails. Then if what God's word isn't happening, is it God's fault or is it my fault? Many Christians, many people who call themselves Christians, I believe aren't living the way that God intended them to live. They're following their own will. They're following their own desires, praying that God would come along with them, that God would hitch his trailer to their, their desires, their will, their plan, their purpose. Can I hear an amen? amen. And God's not doing it. And so people are wondering, well, well, where's God? And they're turning their back on the church, blaming God when it was them. It's, it's me. It's, it's my obligation. It's my responsibility to follow the instruction of God's word. God told Joshua, he, he, said, he said, follow my instruction. Don't let these instructions uh, uh, leave you. Let me just take a quick look at that. Joshua, the first chapter. God tells Joshua, he says in, that, in chapter 1, verse 8, he says, study this book of instruction continually. He doesn't call it a book of promises, which there are many promises in it. But if you look at the word of God as a book of promises, then what you're doing, you're reading it, looking at what God is obligated to, to do for you or to do to you. Right. And so then we're sitting back in our prayer closet, God, why aren't you doing? Because this isn't a book of promises. It's a book of instruction. Yes. And there are conditions that need to be met before God is going to put his favor or his backing on your life. Amen. And I want us as a church, I want you as, as, a, as an individual in, in your family, I want you to fi be firing on all cylinders. I want it to be so evident that people are calling you up and saying, asking you like, what are you doing? You, you're doing something different. And you can, re, you can uh, quote to them Proverbs 3, 3, 5, and 6. I'm trusting in the Lord. Before I was, I, I said I was trusting him, but it was only with my word and my heart was far from him. But now I'm actually pressing in to the very thing that Christ is building and my life is following suit. My life is transforming before my eyes. It, it, it's nutty to me too. 
Because if I'm able to do it on my own, that's not God, that's me. But if things are happening that I couldn't do for 30 years and it happens in, in 30 seconds, that's God. Amen. For me, I was praying some things that I picked up. Maybe you can relate to this. I picked up some things in high school. And it was cool when I picked them up because I had a bunch of friends around me doing it too. And then you, 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 start, you, you, you find yourself all by yourself and you're still doing these stupid things. And then for me, I was looking into my future. I was looking into my, my, my 60s and my, my 70s and my 80s. And I was thinking, if I keep doing what I'm doing, I may not even make it that long. And I saw as these things were progressively getting worse and worse and worse in my own life. And I began to pray, God, take these out of my life. And he wouldn't do it. And the big thing that, that he, he showed me, the revelation that I got is... He, he let me know that he wasn't going to take anything from me that I wasn't willing to give to him on my own. And so I was praying that God would take these things away from me the whole time. I had it behind my back, squeezing it as tight as I could. Lord, I just, cause, you know why? Because we don't want to follow the instruction. We just want the good that comes with the reward. But in order to receive the re reward, we've got to follow the instruction. Amen. That, that's, that's good. That'll preach. And so he tells, tells Joshua, be careful to obey the instruction Moses gave you. Be, this is, that was in verse 7. He says, don't deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything. Someone say everything. everything. Not just a couple things, not just the things you're good at, but in everything you set out to accomplish because you're following God's purpose. You're following his plan. You'll be successful in everything that you do. That's not a pipe dream. But it's not going to happen just because I pray for it. Or just because I read a scripture. Or because I, I go to church on a Sunday. But it's because I wake up every morning. First thing, God. God is on my heart. I'm pursuing God's purpose. I'm pursuing the advancement of the kingdom of God right here and right now, not only in my life, but in the lives of the people around me. And I make God's business priority in my life. And when you do that, he makes your business priority in his life. Amen. Amen. And so the, the message that I'm going to share with you today on, on faith is this. Faith gives power over every enemy. Faith gives power over every enemy. I don't, I don't want us to think that there are like the enemies that, that God is able to defeat because we have faith are the, like the, the junior scout or like the Eagle scout, like, uh, problems or the, 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 the boy scout or the, what's the girls one? The brownies, the brownies scout, uh, is it brownie scouts? I have a four year old little girl. She's not that old enough yet, I guess. Um, but what I'm trying to say is that God isn't after just the little things in our life that, that oh, God can take care of that. But the big things, you know, you got to go somewhere else. You got to go, you got to find someone else, or you got to deal with that with the rest of your life. I want you to know that whatever you bring to Christ by faith, if it's crushing you, by the time Christ gets done with you, you will be crushing those things. Those things won't be over your head. They won't be eye level. They won't be walking side by side. But every step you, you take, you'll be walking on its head because you have dominion over it. Yeah, come on. Give, give the Lord the praise. This is the power of, of having faith in Christ, not because of who you are, not because of who I am. But even in my insecurities, even in my weaknesses, even in my flaws, God, having faith in God will produce a, a, a wonderful result. And whatever it is, it will, it, will have to, it will have to fall underneath the authority of Christ under your feet if Christ is living on the inside of you. Amen. So faith gives power over every enemy not just some not just the weak ones but every enemy and, I, and I, I want you to know on that note 
because this is, this is a really popular thing going on uh, of justifying sin. That's, how did that become a curse word in, in church? Sin. That's the very thing that separates us from God. And so if we make light of sin and we begin to justify sin, no one gets transformed. No one changes and everyone just kind of goes to church and kind of, we, we fake it. But if we realize that through Christ, following Christ, that we are no longer obligated to sin. That ob- when we're out in the world, it's an obligation. We see it on the, on the TV screen. We're out the door. That even the suggestion of it, we're, we're out the door. We're putting it in our mouth or putting it on our body, in our body. And so where do you find that, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. Go with me to Romans, the eighth chapter. Romans chapter eight. Because I want you to see that we, if, you're a, if you're a born again believer, you're no longer a sinner. God no longer considers you a sinner. And there are denominations, there are people, churches, who are preaching from the pulpit that you're nothing, and they'll categorize them, they'll put themselves in the same category, we're nothing uh, but sinners saved by grace. Meaning that sin still dominates you. But then, how do you get around that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world? How do you get around uh, those things? So, so go with me to Romans 8th chapter. And the ninth verse, Paul talking to the, the church in Rome, he says, but you are not controlled by your sinful nature. Someone say, I am not controlled by my sinful nature. Say it. This is what the word of God says. This is not what the church says. This is not what some organization or corporation or some pastor is saying. This is the word of God. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by who? The spirit or the Holy Spirit or the spirit of God or the spirit of Christ that lives in you. And so notice what he says. He says you are controlled by the spirit if... If you have the spirit of God living in you and if you're born again by the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit has taken up residence in your life and your life has, has, has uh, been a reflection of that. You can't become born again and have the spirit of God living in you and continue on in the same path, the same trajectory. But there's going to be a transformation. There's going to be a change. He said, and remember that those who do not have the spirit of Christ living in them, be careful now, don't get offended, do not belong to him at all. So the Holy Spirit is the guarantee that we belong to Christ. He is the first installment. He is the... He is the the, the guarantee that all that God has promised to us is going to come to pass. That it's going to happen. Amen. Amen. And he goes on. He says, and Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, he says the spirit gives you what? Life. The spirit gives you life. Jesus said, I have come that you would have life and that you would have it more abundantly. He says, gives you life because you have been made right with God. You are in right standing or in right relationship with God because you have made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. He says, the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead. Now, don't miss this. This is good. The spirit of God or the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. In other words, the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that resurrected that lifeless body of our Savior, Jesus Christ, from that grave on the third day is the same power, is the same spirit that lives on the inside of every single born again believer. Can I hear an amen? Amen. If you believe that today, would you put your hands together for Jesus? Faith gives you power over every enemy, over every enemy. What is the greatest enemy that any human has? Death. 
Jesus conquered death. The greatest enemy that we face, that we, we, have, we, have, no, we have no answer to, Jesus is that answer. And if he conquered death, what, is the, what are the, any of those other little things in your life? If you're dealing with anger, he can help you. I wasn't looking at you because you're dealing with anger. I saw that look in your eye like, oh crap, is he talking about me? I, th- I felt like we just had a moment. I'm going to go through all week. Anyway, whatever it is, depression. I'll close my eyes now. anxiety, you name it, fill in the blank for yourself. If you think that it's an impossible situation, it's, it's a great opportunity to prove God that he still exists, that he is still on his throne, that he still wants to save you. He still wants to deliver you. And whatever it is you're struggling with, he doesn't want you to struggle with it anymore. He wants it to be under your feet so that you can be a testimony and example, not only to yourself, you'll be a witness to yourself. I'm a witness to myself, but also a testimony to my family. And testimony to my coworkers. They're going to see a contrast be- between uh, B- B.C. and A.D. before Christ and when you came to Christ. But they, didn't, they don't know that you came to Christ until you begin to live it out and to speak it out. Uh, Revelation 12, 11 says the enemy, Satan himself, is defeated by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. Amen. And so if we keep our mouths shut... And we don't say anything and there's no visible expression of God working in our lives. What does James say? James says faith without works is dead. It's useless. It's not faith at all. It's something else. And so there's got to be a visible expression of what God has done and what he is doing. And realize it doesn't stop. There's no end in this life. To the progression, to the, to the, uh, you know, it's, it's going from victory to victory. I'm not going from victory to sickness and then hopping back to victory and then, and then, uh, hopping to some, some other thing that's disrupting my life. There's no in, in Christ. Now someone say in Christ. In Christ. So in the world, the, the, the world can't say this, but in Christ, there are no drought moments. There are no wilderness moments. You look through the, the, the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, when people were walking around and wandering around in the wilderness, it's because they were out of the will of God. God had given them an instruction and they walked away. But when, oh, I love this, because God is a God of grace. I'm glad, I'm so happy, I'm excited that I can, I can preach now because I, I'm preaching under the covenant of grace. We're not under judgment right now. That's coming. That's on its way. Jesus is coming back. And when he comes back, he's not coming back as a humble servant. He's coming back as a roaring lion. He's coming back to, to, uh, to bring judgment, to bring his kids home, but also to bring judgment on the world who refused to receive him. Man. And so that's why it's exciting for me. I'm not here preaching judgment and and condemnation and shame. But I'm here to let you know that whatever you've been through, no matter what, you, even, even an hour ago, before you got to service, no matter what you did, God can set you free from whatever that thing was, whatever that thing is, and you don't have to walk in bondage any longer. You may have come into this place with a broken heart. God is able to bind that heart and make that heart brand new and to heal you Whatever hurts you've experienced. I'm telling you, the, the sky is, is not even the limit. What's beyond the sky, you know? There is no limit. There's no threshold when it comes to our God. Turn with me in your, in your Bible to Mark, the sixth chapter. I'm going to try to get on track. I'm glad you think so. Mark, the sixth chapter. I'm going to kind of overlap where we started last week. Just kind of making our way through this thing called faith. Because there's so many people who are declaring that they have faith, 
but there's nothing to show for it. You know, there's nothing. It was James, it was again, James, the book of James. He says, um, I will show you my faith by my works. How do you know someone has faith? It's visible. The works that they do, the things that are going on in their life, the direction of their life takes a completely different angle. It goes in a completely different way. I'm no longer on my path, but I'm on the path that God has instructed for me. And go, let's go to that. Let's start with that fifth verse. In chapter 6, verse 5 in Mark. And because of their unbelief, we read this last week, Jesus couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. So there we go again. What I said earlier, God putting the, 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 the responsibility back on us. Because you've got to realize that not only can Jesus do anything, he can do everything. And if we're not putting our faith in him, we're not allowing him to do what he's been wanting to do in our lives the whole time. Like I said last week, faith is the vehicle that God has chosen to use for his creation to receive from him. Faith is that vehicle. That all the things that God wants to give to us, that is the vehicle that God has chosen to use so that he can give us the, de the desires of his heart, the things that he wants us to have. And without faith, we see here, because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles. So was it because Jesus couldn't, or was it because of their unbelief? It was because of their unbelief. And then in verse 6, and he was amazed at their unbelief. Then Jesus went from village to village, teaching the people. And he called his 12 disciples together and began sending them out two by two, giving them authority. Someone say authority. Jesus gave them that authority to do what? To cast out evil or unclean spirits. You see, faith gives power over every single enemy. Whatever enemy you might have, whatever enemy that is coming against you, you got to realize that you may feel like you are surrounded, but to realize that if you have faith in God, you believe in God, that your enemies also are surrounded. And there's no escape for them. And the only thing that we have to do is stand firm. What does the word of God say? I believe it. I'm not going to say where it's at. I think it's, I think it's first Peter, but, um, he says, Oh, it just slipped my mind. We'll move on. Um, so he's given us authority to cast out evil spirits. I want to show you that this is still standing today. Because not only did Jesus give this authority to the disciples who were in front of him, but watch what he says. Go with me a couple pages to your right. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Check this out. Because this is for you and I today. This promise is still standing. In chapter, Mark chapter 16, verse 15, and Jesus then told them, go into the, all the world and preach the good news to how many people? Everyone. When, uh, when, our, when our soul winning team goes to Walmart, I feel like that's what we're doing. We're, we're inviting every single person. There are some people who are, who are uh, super receptive and there are others who are like, okay, I'll take one just to make you feel good. There are other people who just reject, just like, uh, what is that? Uh, just a big X, just like, no, like they're offended that you would even like invite them. And uh, Jesus said, go out into the world to, and preach the good news to how many people, everyone. And he says here, he says, anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. So that, that leaves no one out. Every single person, no matter the color of your skin, no matter your nationality, no matter what language you speak, no matter what your education is or isn't, no matter what, whatever it is, if you're, if you're being excluded, it's because you're excluding yourself. 
Christ has included every single person because he created us. He's the one who created us. And so my dad taught me when I was a kid, he told me to look at everyone as a living soul. Everyone has a soul. Everyone it has an eternal soul that lives on the inside of them. And when I look at people, I don't see maybe what they're throwing at me. But I see that, that there's potential. There's an opportunity for God to do a work on the inside of them and creating a testimony in their life. So anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. Uh, another another uh, verse in the Bible says that um, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. They're bringing that condemnation on themselves. Verse 17, these miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. So he says there's going to be these miraculous supernatural signs that follow those who believe, who have their faith in Christ. And the first one he says is they will cast out demons in my name. Can I hear someone say amen? Amen. And it's not just like the junior demons and like the, the, the small fry demons. What did Jesus say? Jesus said that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. One person who was born again, filled with the Holy Spirit against the entire, you just put the entire gates of hell team against you. That one born again believer has more power, more authority, more strength than all of the gates of hell combined. Can I hear an amen? Amen. And so you don't have to, to go through life thinking, well, maybe God, God can't do this one. No, he's putting the, the responsibility back on you. Do you believe? Are you trusting? And if you are, your life will be a reflection of that. It will be visible not only to you, but to the people around you. They will cast out demons in my name. Who, who is he talking about? Those who believe. That is still active today, if you believe. And they will speak in new languages, or they will speak in a heavenly tongue. This is every single uh, born-again believer has the opportunity to have the gift of speaking in tongues. If you, if, I'm not going to go there right now. did a whole teaching on a, on a breakthrough Wednesday night service. But in 1 Corinthians 14, if you're taking notes, you'll see there where Paul... He talks about speaking in tongues. He says, I speak in tongues more than any of you. And he says, you should be seeking after the the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit that would be most beneficial to to the, the church, to the body of Christ. And to be seeking after these gifts. And what, because speaking in tongues or speaking in, in new languages, speaking in that heavenly language, uh, he also says in, in, that, in uh, 1 Corinthians 14 that when you're speaking in, in that tongue, that you're speaking directly to God. And so I make it, I just want you to know as your pastor, I make, I'm, I make it uh, a daily thing, a daily habit where I'm speaking in tongues to the Lord. And so I, what I'll do is I'll, I'll begin to speak in tongues and then God will put something on my heart or something will come to my mind and I'll just begin to worship him or make a request or say how much I love you. And then I'll go back into speaking in tongues again. And what it does, you'll see it in first Corinthians 14. What it does is it brings strength to the person who is speaking in the Holy Spirit. 18. They will be able to handle snakes with safety. The snakes are coming out. You got the snakes ready? Just kidding. Just kidding. No. <laughs> no. Maybe if we were like in the, what, Kentucky? Where would we have to be? We're not going to be doing that. He's not, saying, he's not saying play around with snakes. We see where Paul, Paul, they were around the campfire. The apostle Paul, he was bit by a poisonous snake. Didn't, didn't even affect him. The poison entered into his body, but the the spirit of God, I want you to know that the spirit of God and our faith in him, it conquers every, every poison. 
every disease, every virus, every single enemy that would come to to conquer you or to defeat you. When it comes at you, if you are a born again believer, you're standing in faith in Christ. That thing has no choice but to be defeated. It has no choice but to be conquered. I feel faith rising in this place. They will be able to handle snakes with safety. And if they drink anything poisonous, it will not hurt them. I, I heard a story. And we're not going around drinking stuff that's going to hurt you. Because uh, the word of God tells us not to tempt the Lord our God. Don't, don't play around with that stuff. Um, but uh, there, was a, there was a missionary uh, who was uh, bringing Bibles in, secretly bringing Bibles into a communist. I don't remember what, what nation it was, but a communist nation sneaking in Bibles and, and preaching the gospel to these, to these people who didn't have access to Bibles and the gospel. And they, they, this missionary uh, was found out, was discovered, and the authorities brought him in and began to interrogate him. And they put a, a, a cup of water in front of him because he was thirsty. Not knowing that obviously the people knew, but he didn't know. The missionary did not know that it was filled with cyanide. And they knew that just the, just the littlest sip was going to kill him, drop, drop dead instantly. <laughs> and this missionary didn't know, but drank the water because he was thirsty. And he drank the water. He finished the water. And the, the, the people there that were interrogating him were just staring at him, waiting for something to happen. And they realized that the power of God was more powerful than any deadly poison that they would put in front of this man. He says here, I love this too. They will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed in Jesus name. Not by might, not by power, not by my own wisdom or my own understanding because I don't understand it. But by my spirit, saith the Lord, you put your trust in him. You put your faith in him, in Jesus Christ and his finished work. Because he's he's accomplished all the work that needs to be done. And when we put our faith on him, we're putting all the weight on him to accomplish what he said that he would accomplish in and through us. In verse eight, he told them to take nothing for their journey except a walking stick. No food, no traveler's bag, no money. So he gives them specific instructions. He allowed them to wear sandals. Thank you, Jesus. But not to take a change of clothes. He said, wherever you go, Jesus said, wherever you go, stay in the same house until you leave town. But if any place refuses to welcome you or listen to you, shake its dust from your feet as you leave to show that you have abandoned those people to their fate. In, in uh, Luke, the 10th chapter, the 16th verse, Jesus tells his disciples, if anyone accepts what, you, what you're telling them, that I've told you to tell them, they're not accepting you, they're accepting me. Yes. If they reject you, realize the same thing is true. They're not rejecting you, but they're rejecting me. That's what Jesus said. And Jesus finished that off by saying, if the, and, and if they are rejecting me, they're rejecting God the Father, the one who sent me. And so to realize that, I guess the, the take home here, the, the, the phrase here is, don't take it personal. When a family member rejects you, realize that a lot of times when someone is uh, super exaggerated in their expressive rejection, a lot of times it's because they're dealing with something that they need help with. And so don't take offense. Don't, don't look at what you can see in front of you, but trust that, that if you are speaking the truth of God's word, that it's penetrating. The enemy is being stirred, I'm telling you. And when you see him begin to stir, get excited. Don't, don't take it personal. Don't, don't allow yourself to take it home with you and to take their, their rejection and, and take it as something that you, you now carry around with you. Because that's not yours to carry. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Christ. Put the weight on his shoulders. Lord, I'm only trusting you. I'm leaning on you. 
And just as many times as maybe you rejected Christ, it might take that many times or more for them. So be patient like God is patient with you. Did you know that's the only reason why Jesus hasn't come back yet? Is because he's being patient with those who, who aren't saved yet? Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Because if that wasn't the case, I, I might not be saved. He would have come back a long time ago. And so thank you, Lord. And so to realize that, yes, we want to, we want to be uh, with you, Lord. But at the same time, we know that we have unsaved loved ones. So to realize that us getting raptured or Jesus coming back for his children means that any unsaved loved ones aren't going. So realize the eternal implications and we can kind of try to want to skirt Jesus and say, God, why, aren't you, why, why are you being so, um, uh, why are you waiting so long to fulfill your promise? Because I'm being patient with your loved ones. Just like I was being patient with you. Now get to work. Live by faith, not by what you see. Love on your family. If they're, if they're lost and because they're on TikTok all day. And they're, they're just, their lives are an expression of, of what it looks like when you're broken. Don't hold it against them, but see that as an opportunity to love on them and to, to share with them the love that you received. The reason why you are saved today is not because someone rejected you. It's because someone wrapped their arms around you and said, hey, son, or hey, daughter. And I guarantee you, I, I already know. That when you came to Christ, Christ didn't say, what took you so long? He said, welcome home, son. Welcome home, daughter. And that is how we should be if we're walking by faith. Because the enemy will use those things. He'll, he'll, he will use you as a Jesus follower to be a distraction for those who are maybe on the cusp because realize that Satan, no, he doesn't, he, doesn't, he can't read your mind. He doesn't know what you're thinking. Amen. Satan doesn't. But he, he reads your, he observes and he reads your movements. And so he knows that our, when our soul winners go out, he knows who's picking up these, uh, these invitations. He knows that maybe someone put it on, the, on the, uh, the, the table and that someone in that house is ripe and ready. Jesus said that the harvest is ripe. Harvest is, is white unto harvest. We're not waiting for a time of harvest. The time is now. We're going out into the field and bringing in souls for the kingdom of God. And so what the enemy will do is he'll use you, try to use you as a distraction to reject them because he, he knows that, that maybe that's something that you don't like or something that bugs you. And so to, dr to, to drive that rejection home into their lives rather than, and I'm not saying we're accepting their sin, that's not what I'm saying. We're not justifying their sin. I'm just saying we're loving the person. We're loving the person and showing them maybe the error of their ways without saying I'm showing you the errors of your way. Because that's a turnoff even for me. Even when I see, uh, you know, uh, someone who calls themselves a Christian on the, on the side of the road with a, a sign that says uh, you're going to hell or something like that. Like that's a turn. Like, I don't even want to be a Christian at that point. If that's what it is, but that's not what it is. So Jesus says, if they refuse to welcome you or listen to you, shake its dust, shake the, the dust from that place, from off of your feet as you leave to show that you have abandoned those people to their fate. And what is that saying? It reminds me of what, what God did with Pharaoh. Uh, it, when Mo, God was using Moses to free uh, the, uh, the, the nation of Israel out of Egyptian slavery of hundreds of years, God was using Moses to speak to Pharaoh. And the word of God tells us that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. In the same way, what God did was he handed him over to his own desires. He handed him over to, to the very thing that he wanted that 
that turned out to, to his, his own demise. And so if someone rejects you, this is what he's telling his disciples. He says, shake the dust off of your feet. Don't take it personal, but just leave them to their own desires and just move on to the next person. Move on to the next village. Move on to the next city. Amen. Amen. So what did the disciples do? Verse 12. So the disciples went out telling everyone. How many people did they tell? Everyone. everyone so that they met to repent of their sins and turn to God. And notice what they did. They were given authority and they cast out demons. They cast out many demons and healed many sick people, anointing them with olive oil. And I read, I'm reading Mark chapter six as a pref, as a as a preface to chapter nine. Would you turn with me to Mark the, chap, uh, the ninth chapter and go to the 14th verse? Because I want to show you this. Because there's something interesting that happens that Jesus calls out to his disciples because Jesus gave them the authority to cast out evil spirits or unclean spirits. And there's something uh, that happens here in, in the ninth chapter of Mark. When they returned to the other disciples... They saw a large crowd surrounding them, and some teachers of religious law were arguing with them. When the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe, and they ran to greet him. Because they, they had, so the people had come to, to, to see Jesus. But Jesus with, was with uh, Peter, James, and John. And I, I uh, suggest to you to read the first part of the ninth chapter. Uh, that leads up to the 14th verse uh, for your own sake. And, um, and so they were gone. As they approached, they see this, this mob out there and they're arguing. Uh, they see these religious leaders out there. They see uh, the people, the, the regular average town people. They, and then Jesus sees also his disciples there. And there's a bunch of arguing going on. And so Jesus walks up and as they were greeting him, what's all this arguing about? Like, what's, what's going on? And one of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, teacher, I brought my son so that you could heal him. He's possessed by an evil spirit that will not let him talk. So to realize that, that different spirits, different evil spirits have different tools that they use um, against people. So this was a dumb and deaf spirit that caused this boy, this man's child, uh, to not be able to speak and evidently not to be able to, to also not be able to hear. But I want to, I want to bring you good news because if you are born again, the, the evil, an evil spirit cannot dwell in the same place that the Holy Spirit dwells. I, you need to know that. So I can't preach a, a message called faith gives power over every enemy if this is not true. If it is true that the spirit of the enemy or an evil spirit can live on the inside of, 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 of where the Holy Spirit is also living, that means that the light of God isn't that strong. That we need something more powerful. But... The word of God tells us greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So the enemy that try, would try to come into our lives if, in the same way that the, the Israelites, they, they, they brushed on the, the blood of that lamb on their doorpost and the, the death angel had to pass over. It's the same way. If the blood of Christ has been applied to the doorpost of your heart, no enemy, great or small, no, no matter how many come against you, they, they, they do not have more authority than you do in Christ Jesus. And so obviously this child was not born again. And notice what he says. He says, he, I brought my son so that you could heal him. He's possessed by an evil spirit that will not let him talk. And whenever the spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. Then, it foam, then he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid or stiff. It looks like he's dead. And so this father brings his son to Jesus and 
he realizes that even though he's having symptoms of a seizure, he realizes that it's not a physical problem, but it's a spiritual one. He's possessed by an evil spirit or an unclean spirit. And so he, he's bringing his son to Jesus so that Jesus could cast the devil out of him. He's, he says, so, so, so I asked your disciples, because you weren't here, Jesus, to cast out the evil spirit, but they could not do it. What did we just read in chapter 6? Jesus gave them authority to do all these miraculous signs and wonders that would prove that they were attached to Jesus, that Jesus is the Messiah, that he's the Savior, he's the Son of God, that, that, that they have power from God himself, but they couldn't do it. And notice what Jesus' response was to his disciples. Jesus said to his disciples, he says, you faithless people, You faithless people. Could there be uh, any greater of a cut? And I want us to see here, I want us to take our eyes off of the disciples and put them on, our, on, on you, on, your, on yourself. Have we come to a place in our relationship with God where we've become comfortable? Where we've become complacent where now we're, we're, when we first came to Christ we, we, we were looking for an opportunity we were looking for an instruction we didn't care so we were, we were so sensitive to the spirit that we didn't care if we, if, we, if we heard his voice but realized that it was our voice but we were just wanting we were so we were more concerned about following Christ than following ourselves that sometimes we got it wrong right have we got to the place where we're like, okay, now we're picking and choosing what instructions that we want to follow? Are we picking and choosing uh, if maybe, if, well, actually this one doesn't really benefit me, or this one is actually, it looks like it might be a little bit painful, so I'm going to skip this one, but still wanting the favor of God, but now becoming complacent, and instead of being sensitive, we become rigid with God. And not allowing him to do in us because we have, we, we're not pliable anymore. Are you following me? And so this could be a reason why many people aren't experiencing the favor of God in their lives. It's not that God has stopped instructing you. It's that maybe you're starting to pick and choose and you've become soft on sin. Maybe you become soft on, on uh, following God's instruction. You, you kind of like um, when you start getting the, th the hang of things, like in, in life, you start off with training wheels. And then eventually you get to the point where I don't need those training wheels anymore. And so you take the training wheels off and you begin to coast and you begin to ride by yourself. You don't need daddy anymore holding the, the back seat with you anymore. But when we do that in a relationship with God, the outcome and the end result isn't a good one. We actually are walking away from God's favor. We're walking away. See, unbelief hinders God from being able to give to us what he wants to give to us. Faith is that vehicle that God has chosen to use to get to us what he's been wanting to get to us all along. And that's why we don't walk by, by, by sight. We don't walk by uh, looking at our circumstance because those things will throw you off every single time. We're not following our heart. Our heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? God knows it, so be careful. And so we are following God's word. We're, we're getting to know God more and more each day. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. So... And, as Jesus followers, we need to be practicing every single day, listening to the voice of God, having a, a, a sense of urgency of, God, I don't want to miss you. God, I know, I know the only reason good things are happening in my life is because I'm, I'm directly tied to you, and I don't want to do anything to sever that. I don't want to allow uh, maybe a job 
opportunity to, to come in between me and God's relationship because that's, that's a very common thing. Someone will get saved and then uh, they'll, they'll be without, they'll, they'll be down in the dumps and then they'll get saved. God will begin to bless them and guess what happens? Guess what the employer does? You're going to be working, like if you have church, it, he's going to schedule, he or she is going to schedule on those very days, even though you requested those very ones off. And I'm telling you, that's not God. God's not going to do that to you. And so don't take that as a, as a blessing from God, but take that as an opportunity to trust God. God, I'm not, I'm not in this world so that I can make money. Money is not my, my, my source. It's a resource that you have provided for me. And it's, it's an opportunity just to realize that maybe, just maybe, you're being put to the test. Where is your loyalty? Is it in a resource or is it in the source? I'm telling you, if God gave you that job, on the other side of you making a stand, because no, no employer can make you work on, on the day of, that you worship your God. And so if you will stand your ground, I remember my dad telling the story about himself. He was working for a company and he was, he was growing in, in the company. And the employer said, you're going to have to work on, uh, on Sundays. And my dad said, no, I, I can't work on that day. That's the day that I, I worship God. That's the day I go to church. And his, his, his boss just kept just like, no, this is the way it's going to be. And if you, if you can't work that day, you, you, just, you can't work for us. My dad, my dad stood his ground to make a long story even longer. Um, he stood his ground. And at the end of that, his boss was just putting him to the test to see where his loyalty lied. Because there's not very many loyal people these days. And if you're going to be loyal to your church and you're going to be that loyal, I want you to come work for me. My dad ended up getting the job and start getting, uh, he, he was uh, offered management because of his stand for God. You see, we can't look at those, oppor- at those things as opportunities, but maybe they're a trick from the enemy trying to distract us because he sees that there's been a change in your life and to kind of head you off of the past, he's going to try, he's going to try to cut, cut your legs off from underneath you and get you to be distracted by something else that doesn't really matter that much. It's temporary, but our relationship with God, the, the implications are eternal. Someone say the implications are eternal. They're not temporary. Yeah. He says, you faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. And you always see Jesus doing this. You always see Jesus not rejecting people, but saying, come to me. All of you who are weary, carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. So they brought the boy. But when the evil spirit saw Jesus, and I love this because the evil spirit reacted The evil spirit threw the child into a violent convulsion and he fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. So we see here the power of Satan. We see that that the evil spirits do have power. But they don't have power. They don't have authority where the blood of Christ has been applied. And so we have nothing to worry about, but we, we need to see this and not gloss over it to see that, yes, Satan does have power. And if you don't have Christ as your savior, if you don't have Christ as your Lord, you are vulnerable to the tricks of the enemy. You're vulnerable to, to the things that we're seeing here in this ninth chapter. How long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, since he was just a little boy, the spirit often throws him into the fire or into water, trying to kill him. And notice what he says. He, has, he says, have mercy on us and help us if you can. If you can. Notice what Jesus says. He says, what do you mean if I can? And he follows that up by saying, anything is possible if a person believes. Faith gives power 
over every enemy. I don't care what it is or how many are coming at you all at once. If you will stand your ground by faith, whether it's a, a personal thing, or whether it's a thing with you and your, your husband or your wife, or it's a thing with you and your children or your family, I've seen God take the worst of scenarios, the worst of situations, turn them around where there was, a, there was no way that there was going to be a relationship with that father and with those children. It wasn't going to happen. It was impossible. It, it was dead, buried in the ground. It, it, was, it was nothing but a bag of bones. And God be allowed into that situation by faith and somehow, some way, there was a, a restoration. There was a reconciliation where it, it, it wasn't possible. But faith gives power over every single enemy. Can I hear an amen? amen? He says anything is possible if a person believes. The father instantly cried out, I do believe. But help me overcome my belief. So the word of God tells us that faith comes by hearing. How do we receive faith? Faith comes by hearing. And what are we hearing? The word of God. But I want you to know, how is, how is faith uh, released? By speaking it. That's why I repeat myself over and over and over again. Like I said last week, some of my favorite preachers, some of my favorite uh, pastors that I follow, that I, that I listen to are repeating themselves and I find myself repeating them. And so is because what I want to do is I want to get the word of God in you. I don't want to give you I don't want to preach on a to, like one little topic so that you can work on that for the rest of the week and hopefully gain control or gain uh, some power over that one little thing. I want to give you the word of God so that no matter what situation you're faced against, no matter what situation you find yourself eyeball to eyeball with, no matter what devil in or out of hell is facing you, that you will have the word of God to speak out and defeat that enemy that has come to destroy you. Can I hear an amen? Amen. What did Jesus do when, when Satan came to tempt him? G, uh, the Holy Spirit, after he was baptized, the Holy Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted of the, of the devil, of Satan. And what did Jesus do? Being the word of God, he spoke the word. He resisted the devil. And what did the devil have to do? He had to flee. He just, you bozo, like what are you, you coming around again? That should be the thing. It shouldn't terrify us. It's almost, almost like a badge of honor. If the enemy is coming up against you, because realize he doesn't, have, he doesn't have anything against us. He has nothing. But what he wants to do is try to convince you away from the word of God, away from keeping yourself connected to the advancement of the kingdom of God and his righteousness so that he can keep you from receiving from God. You see, like, like I said earlier, Satan doesn't know what you're thinking. His only weapon is to try to, try to convince you to forfeit what, you've, what you have in your hand. He can't take anything from you. He can't make you make any choices. All he can do is put a thought in there. He could bring a temptation. But if I'm standing on the word of God, and when he comes at me, if because I have faith, I don't want to just have faith, but I want to release faith into my life, into my situation, into my wife, into my children, into my church, into the people that I come into contact with, and the enemy has to flee. Amen. And I can smile, even chuckle and laugh, knowing that the enemy is defeated every single time. Pastor, you're making it sound simple. It is. It is. We're the ones who make it complicated. Whether it's a relationship, finances, whether it's uh, whatever it is. Think about it. We overcomplicate everything. Christ came to simplify. He did all the hard work. He did all the finished work. Now we put our faith in him. We trust him. We follow him. Let me just finish here to, to 29. 
and we'll pick it up again next week. The father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my belief. So he speaks it out. When Jesus saw that the crowd of onlookers was growing, he rebuked the devil. I don't have time to, maybe next week I can get into this, but I, I wanna share what it, what it means to rebuke the devil rebuke the evil spirit. It's not saying, I rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. There is a way. And Jesus gives us the way here. He says, listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak. I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. Then the spirit screamed and threw the boy into another violent convulsion. And what did he do? Someone say he left him. He had to do exactly what the word spoke. Jesus is the word. And the enemy had to flee with his tail between his legs. The boy appeared to be dead. A murmur ran through the crowd as the people said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet as he does every time. And he stood up. Afterward, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out that evil spirit? Jesus replied, this kind can be cast out only by prayer. Other translations also add fasting. Only by prayer and fasting. And the big idea that I want you to take home here at the, at the end of this message is that we will lose the power that God has given to us if we fail to maintain our faith. And how do we do that? How do we maintain our faith? By staying connected and committed to him. I want to get more into that next week. Uh, we just, we're just out of time. And so would you just stand to your feet all across this place? The word of God has gone forth. Now it's up to us to apply the word of God, to release the word of God by speaking it out, not just today, but throughout the week, this week. I want to give you an opportunity this morning before the worship team sings one last time. I want to give you an opportunity to receive Christ and to have a new beginning. If you've, if you've never received Christ as your Savior, and what you've heard this morning come from the Word of God today is tugging on your heart to do something, to make a change, I'm going to invite you to come forward so that I can pray with you. I can pray over your life and that you can start a new beginning, not with me, not with the church, but with Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, the creator of the heavens and the earth. He loves you and he cares for you so much. If you've never received Christ as your Savior, or if you want to rededicate your life to him today, this is your chance. This is your opportunity. I'm telling you, you're surrounded by people who love you, who care about you. If that's you, would you just, would you just step out of your seat and come stand in this altar? Just come stand shoulder to shoulder right here. I know there's more of you. Would you, would you come? Would you give them a hand clap as they're coming forward this morning? Come on. Come on. We thank you, Lord. Is there anyone else this morning? Yes, come forward. Come stand shoulder to shoulder. Come on, church. Would you give them a hand this morning? We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. We thank you, God. We honor you, Jesus. You want to make a new start. You want to... You want to become brand new in Jesus Christ. I'm gonna, would you sing that song? As, as you're standing here, would you just lift your hands to Jesus? If you're here... making the best decision that you could ever make. Love you, brother. Yeah.
So thankful for the decision you're making today. Heavenly Father, I pray over this life that what the enemy tried to steal, that you would bring back to her as she puts her faith in you a hundredfold. In Jesus' name, those things that were dominating her, that they would no longer have any authority over her life. In Jesus' name. But God, as she gives her life to you, that those things would be under her feet from this day forward, that they would no longer be a struggle from this day forward in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Those of you who are standing here, would you just lift your hands to Jesus? What I want you to do, I just want, I'm going to just lead you in a prayer that's a declaration of your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. Would you repeat these words with me and say, Heavenly Father, I give you my life. I need a Savior. And that's why I'm coming to you. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That He gave His life so that I could live. Not just in this life, but in eternity as well. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. I give my life to you. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of salvation and for setting me free. In Jesus' name name. Now fill me with your Holy Spirit, giving me power and strength and authority over all and every enemy in Jesus' name. Now Lord, make me a testimony for your glory and for your kingdom in Jesus' name name in Jesus name let me pray over you heavenly father I pray God that you would fill with your spirit this morning. We thank you, Lord. You can go back to your seat. My desire, church, if you can't tell, it's only getting gooder and gooder. It's almost like the enemy is getting weaker and weaker, but I just feel like our faith is growing stronger and stronger. Pretty soon, we're not going to have room enough to, to fill this plate. We're going to have it's going to be a problem. We're going to be thinking about knocking walls down because of what God is doing, the glory of God in this place. One of the first prayers that I prayed when I, when I became the lead pastor of this church, and I wrote it down because it was a desire that God put on my heart, was that this place, that Joy Church, would be a beacon of hope in the city that we, that we reside, that God has called us to. 
but also as that light, like a, a, a city set on a hill, you, you can't hide it because the light just illuminates. That this city would become, because of what God is doing here at Joy, it would light up the sur- surrounding cities that people would be flocking from, from miles away because they want a piece of what God is doing here at Joy. I'm telling you, the enemy is real. But he has no strength when it comes to the blood of Jesus Christ. Stand firm. Don't allow yourself to become complacent. Don't allow yourself to be like those disciples. To realize also this was pre-Holy Spirit before the Holy Spirit was dwelling within them. You have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. So you have one up on the disciples at that point in that stage. And so there's no excuse. Dive in headlong into God's word. Dive in headlong into staying in connection and communication with God. Every time the doors of the church are open, find yourself not just walking in by yourself, but having an entourage with you of unsaved friends, family, and loved ones. We're not looking for more Christians. We're looking for more lost people, broken people on their way to hell so that God can pull them up out of the darkness and into his glorious and marvelous light. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Put your hands together for Jesus. Thank you.